Welcome to Essentials for Conducting Anti-Corruption Audits, today's webinar. My name is Jim Kaplan. I'm president and founder of AuditNet.org, the global resource for auditors. This webinar is brought to you by Caseware Analytics. I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Jennifer Ellison is a CFE and CISA. She's the Senior Legal Compliance Manager at Baker Hughes. Jennifer brings more than 17 years of experience to her role as Legal Compliance Manager for Baker Hughes. Her diverse background includes forensic audit, corporate investigations, ethics program management. Her experience also includes proactive fraud testing using data analytics, FCPA auditing, and risk assessment. Marianne Ibrahim is a Senior Counsel Audits and Investigations for Baker Hughes. Marianne leads selected anti-bribery and FCPA compliance efforts at Baker Hughes, including audits of foreign subsidiaries, joint ventures, and commercial sales representatives in high-risk and emerging markets, FCPA risk analysis, compliance due diligence on merger and acquisition targets. She also manages the Global Investigative Database and conducts compliance-related investigation. She assists the Chief Compliance Officer in the development implementation and monitoring of compliance efforts, including policy controls and communication matters. We're very pleased to have these two subject matter experts with us today. Before I turn the floor over to our speakers to introduce the agenda, I'd like to briefly cover the housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a a link to that recording. Uh, we usually try to get that out within uh, within 24 hours, so look for that tomorrow before the weekend. The webinar recording link will be sent to the email address uh, that you use for registration. Because we're operating under NASBA rules, we are required to ask polling questions during the webinar, and CPE certificates will be sent via email to those who answer all of the polling questions. If you're joining us from a, uh, uh, a tablet device, or something, an iPhone or an iPad, you may not be able to respond to the polling questions, in which case just accumulate your answers into a single email and send them to myself, and I will make sure that they get recorded in our records. The CPE certificates and link to the recording will be sent to the email address you use to register. We're not responsible for delivery problems due to spam filters, attachment restrictions, or other controls in place for your email client. You do have the ability to ask questions during the webinar. You can submit questions via the chat box on your screen. We'll try to answer them during or at the conclusion of the webinar. Usually when we break for a polling question is usually a good time and I'll ask for uh, questions. If we if we see questions coming in, I will present them to our uh, our our speakers. Uh, after the webinar is over, you'll also have an opportunity to provide feedback. Please complete the feedback questionnaire. The next slide shows you our disclaimer. I'm not going to read that, but basically it says that the views expressed by the presenters do not necessarily represent the views, positions, or opinions of AuditNet or the presenters' respective organizations. They may have additional disclaimers that they would like to uh, explain to you, but for now, I'd like to turn the floor over to Jennifer to present the agenda and begin the presentation and give maximum amount of time to, uh, to the information. Jennifer? Thank you, James, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to introduce Mary Ann Ibrahim for just a moment, who is going to give a secondary disclaimer. So we just want to reiterate the disclaimers that any um, opinions or any views that Jennifer and I discuss will not necessarily reflect the views of Baker Hughes and maybe our own personal views. Um, additionally, we, um, we cannot discuss issues of the merger, and we um, our employees of Baker Hughes and, and everything we talk about um, relates uh, only to Baker Hughes. Thank you. So um, our, on our agenda today, we're going to talk very briefly about uh, the general FCPA and UK Bribery Acts. We're then going to talk about our FCPA audit program and our processes at Baker Hughes. And then we're going to speak a little bit about data analytics for FCPA audits. And we use FCPA a lot, but a lot of our slides are going to say anti-corruption. We're trying to change that to anti-corruption audits. So, and then we're going to have questions in the end. So feel free to ask questions along the way or save till the end, and we're most um, happy to answer those. So I'll briefly run through this slide. Um, it, 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 it's, all, it's, it's widely understood and known that anti-corruption is, is uh, enforcement is increasing, not just in the US, but worldwide. 
and um, there are books and records provisions that are pretty much strict liability uh, because no intent is really uh, is required or, or will be analyzed in, in uh, respect to books and records, and that there are also criminal and civil penalties um, involved. So the you can move on to the next slide. What's the next slide? Okay, these are just um, some recent uh, matters that have been. Um, and you know, enforcement actions that have taken place with uh, DOJ and SEC uh, settlements. And um, obviously, it's, it's quite costly. And um, the, uh, the branding and image um, costs obviously aren't included um, in, in these penalties. And so it's just um, not something a, a company obviously wants to endure. Um, there are common DOJ settlement terms um, that address peri periodic review and testing for, um, you know, with regards to audits um, and evaluation and effectiveness of uh, programs and detecting violations of any corruption. Um, the, FCC, the FCC and DOJ FCPA resource guide addresses periodical internal audits on, on page 59 and um, the UK Bribery Act also addresses in principle three the importance of assessing and um, analyzing the internal and external risks of bribery on behalf of um, the organization, as well as monitoring and reviewing procedures and making improvements in principle six. So there's plenty of guidance on um, why your sh company should be doing or conducting um, anti-corruption audits. and. Um, if you need support to uh, explain that to your board, just seek the guidance. Cool. So we conduct um, four different types of audits. Um, the first is M&A due diligence for you. So that's a, a pre-due uh, diligence on potential acquisitions. And uh, a lot of the concepts of the um, items that we uh, identify and analyze uh, overlap in these, these audits. So the next is MA post acquisition reviews. Once we acquire a company, we um, send in an audit team and um, review their, their procedures and compare them to our policies and procedures, as well as identify and evaluate some of the items. Um, well, our, it's a complete audit program that um, we apply to that acquisition target, even though it's um, a newly acquired entity. The next is um, uh, takes a lot more of our time, and it's the um, our internal audits of our uh, foreign subsidiaries and, and high risk and emerging markets. And our final um, type of audit we conduct is audit on our third parties. It's not all third parties; it's the highest risk third parties. So it involves our commercial sales representatives and our joint venture partners. All right, and we're going to have our first polling question that Jim's going to put out there for you. Okay, I've launched the first polling question. Please respond to the uh, to the question, and then we will proceed. We do have one question that came in. Uh, probably Marianne is uh, best equipped to answer this. Uh, how do we enforce FCPA violations when most violations occur internationally in countries where such laws do not exist or are not enforced due to corrupt governments? Sure. Um, we, we get that question actually by, by our own employees. Well, it's, it's not, not employees that have been with us long term. I think the Baker culture is so strong in our compliance culture and training is so strong that our, our long-term employees get it. But new employees usually ask this, and, and that's a common uh, question by people that haven't been uh, immersed in the compliance world. And how I handle that when we're doing these audits abroad is um, I always look up local laws. Regardless if they're enforced or not, it is a law, and it is basic that a company must abide by that local law. So I tell people, you know, okay, if if you have trouble, um, usually these are local people, new, new employees, if you have trouble grasping, you know, why the SCPA should apply to you, even though I've explained, you know, to you that you yourself individually can have um, criminal penalties and jail time that the company cannot cover, 
putting all that aside, you yourself should be following your own local laws. And I list those local laws. So I encourage anyone that's going out to a certain country to look up those local laws beforehand and, um, and, and have that as a, um, as a weapon, I guess. OK? Very good. OK. Uh, let me go ahead and close the poll and share the results. OK. All of the above is the answer that uh, was provided by the majority of our attendees. I assume that that is correct? Yep. OK. Excellent. Very good. I'll go ahead and I will hide the, uh, the poll and turn it back to you. OK. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about for a few minutes is audit planning. Um, we begin our audits uh, four to six weeks in advance so that we can coordinate with our local region and geomarket council. We can communicate with the leader of that geomarket or country to let them know we're going. We begin to request data. We review any type of previous audit reports that we have. It's, it's typical of any type of internal audit planning. We review open and closed internal investigations, and we re research current DOJ, SEC, UK Bribery Act enforcements. Um, and we use the Sherman Sterling site uh, for that. So we do the best we can to sort of take a look at the current activities in that region. And then we always coordinate with the locals, to partially because we have to have permission to enter some of those countries, but partially because we want to make sure we do as much as we can up front. And that's similar to you know, most any internal audit, of course, that, that we would conduct. Um, so the next slide is performing the audit. So the basics of performing FCP audits, FCPA and UK Bribery Act you know, anti-corruption audits, is all about identifying points of government interaction and auditing those and performing interviews based around those points of government interaction. So um, you know, this is something that one of my mentors taught me back in the early 2000s when I first started doing FCPA audits, um, is it's all about, all about government interaction. And that can be either direct or indirect. So an example of a direct government interaction is a payment of customs and duties straight to uh, the Ministry of Commerce or straight to the government. Corporate taxes and penalties, social security payments, social insurance, visas and work permits. Um, if we or your company train, directly train government-owned entities, no matter what they are, sometimes they're oil companies, sometimes it's energy and hospitals. And then the annual business licenses and permits. Then an example of an indirect payment is when we pay customs uh, duties to an agent or a freight forwarder or when we use visa processors to do our work permits and residency. If you use a commercial sales agent, a, uh, no matter what you call them, an intermediary, a commercial sales agent, a trade sponsor, um, there's so many different names that companies use for these third party intermediaries and sales agents. If you use distributors, um, I think someone called them a channel partner one time. So it's really important through your interviews to identify points of government interaction and then to then to channel your auditing to those points of government interaction. Um, and then Mary Ann's going to talk about interviewing for a few moments. So um, our interviews are, are conducted by council. Um, auditors will attend certain interviews that they would like to participate in or have additional questions or if they have a finding and um, want to address something directly or have me address it and, and listen to the response, um, they're always welcome. But we, we do try to have uh, compliant, well, we do have compliance counsel lead those audits, those interviews, sorry. Um, and the, it's, it's very important, obviously, in a multicultural uh, setting to, to have someone that's, you know, open to diversity and open-minded and patient and culturally sensitive and, you know, just using the, the, the wrong words or having the wrong attitude or addressing, you know, inappropriately is, will just, just offset the interview. And really, it, it just won't be productive. And, and the, uh, it's, it's very costly. And um, so that, that's just something that, that's extremely important because um, it, it just won't be worth the cost and the commitment that the company is putting forth if they don't engage 
sensitive um, compliance counsel to conduct those interviews. Um, let's see. Also, um, it, this is an audit focus. It's not an internal uh, investigation. Um, it, 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 it's very easy to get down a, um, a trail or a certain line of questioning that can result in something that you know potentially um, could be you know a bribery issue or, or, or pretty huge or, or can just be a completely different type of issue like a fraud issue that needs to be fully investigated. Well, instead of derailing the, the audit interview and going down the road, um, how we handle it is we just extract that issue and then we move on with our questioning with regards to the audit because it's so important. We have so many questions for each interviewee and they're very pointed and tailored specific to the roles that we just uh, we have to get through those questions and that's the priority. And then I set aside separate time to then move on to the investigative interview which is conducted completely differently, has different disclaimers, et cetera. Okay, so selecting interviewees. Um, these are the type of interviewees that we uh, typically uh, try to uh, engage in and discuss. Um, one item that's not on here because it, it's not really typical in our organization, but maybe in yours, is government relations individuals. I know some companies have those in each country or each seg business segment or whatever. If you do, obviously anyone that has any contact or potential contact with, with the government or um, SOEs, state-owned entities, then um, those must be on your interview list. Um, business uh, development sales guys usually are working with um, our national oil companies or dealing sometimes with regulatory issues, et cetera. And so if that's the case, then they're, they're always um, on our list. Um, and the rest is, is pretty much self-explanatory. Can I make a quick comment about um, the good working relationship we have with auditors? I think one of the things that makes our team work so well together is our constant communication and the great relationship we have. So my team, I, again, this is Jennifer, my team would be the internal audit, um, sorry, the compliance audit, and um, we are able to join some of the finance-related interviews, but we have a great communication to go back and forth. If we find something, we give it to legal. If legal hears something in an interview, they give it to us, and we constantly communicate during the entire audit. It, it really, that, that is really essential for, for teamwork and effectiveness of an audit for both groups to work together. Absolutely. Okay, we're ready for polling question number two, James. Okay, polling question number two is up there. Please respond to the polling question. We'll leave that open for about a minute. Uh, let me see if there are any additional questions that have come in. I don't see any. If anybody has any questions, please submit them. Jennifer, I know that you use uh, IDEA yes. for your uh, for your audits. Uh, will you be demonstrating IDEA today, or is that just uh, you're going to be discussing? No, I, I, no, I'm not going to have a live presentation okay. for IDEA today. But I have a lot of screenshots to show what our screens look like and the tools that we use. Excellent. Sorry about that. I do I do the live presentations during the automation North America user group meetings every couple of years. Right, every two years. Yeah, in the live webinars, but. And I think that should be coming up uh, next year. I think so. They just had a call for speakers for that, so. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. All right. Uh, we've got 94% of voted. Uh, we'll leave it open for another 10 seconds and. Uh, other people are voting now, so we're going to go ahead and we will close the poll, share the results, and it looks like the majority said distributors with 60%. Excellent. Okay. Let me go ahead and hide that and turn the floor back to you. All right. Uh, so now we're going to get into our audit program, which is probably why everyone's here, rather than us drooling on about the rest of FCPA. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the data request. Uh, we specifically request the trial balance, and we'd like this in electronic form, of course, not in PDF, but in some kind of data file format. 
the trial balance, the chart of accounts, journal entry line items for our period and for specific GL accounts, um, financial and, uh, finance and compliance policies, audited financial statements, bank recs and statements, list of agents used by that area, and revenue by country. Obviously, we're going to get different response according to who we're auditing. We, we're not always going to be able to get this on a pre-acquisition due diligence M&A audit. We will get everything we ask for in a post-acquisition and everything we ask for when we audit our business units. Um, we might get minimal information if we are upfront, if we're auditing a, an agent or intermediary or JV partner, but then we'll get it all the first day that we're there. Um, so it's it's a little bit different, but we have a standard request, and this is generally the standard re request we have for each audit that we perform. And then Mary Ann is going to go through our anti-corruption audit program for a few minutes. Um, let me go through the, do you want me to go through the GL accounts yeah. for a moment? Yeah, sorry. Um, here are the general GL accounts that we look at, and these should generally reflect your assessment of your government interaction, uh, whether it's direct or indirect. So of course we want to look at any kind of commission payments that are made. We want to look at facilitating payments, which are not allowed. Travel, meals, and entertainment, training, gifts, charity. Um, I don't need to read the entire uh, list, I think, but you get the picture that we are trying to look at every GL account that could possibly hold payments related to government interaction. And so uh, so just should definitely reflect the interviews and reflect your assessment of your points of government interaction. So bank accounts and cash disbursement controls. Um, with bank accounts, obviously this is this is a key area. Um, you have to trace the money, right, and make sure you know um, uh, what 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 money is coming in and then where it's going out. Um, how those accounts are being reconciled, making sure that those um, individuals responsible for the reconciliation have a segregation of duties. Um, to make sure you know their their duties aren't overlapping and that they can they can um, uh, potentially um, misstate something or, or not reconcile something correctly to cover their tracks. Um, looking, we're looking at offshore accounts and signatories. That's something very important because if, if you're in a big organization like ours, we have people moving around constantly and being promoted often. And so those signatories may not remain the same, so it's imperative to keep those signatories updated and um, that's, that's always a huge focus for us. Um, and then, you know, always uh, checking to see if there's any offshore accounts, um, especially for our third parties. We want to know um, what what type of business our, our third party is, is conducting, especially with regards to um, particularly with our accounts. And um, are they sending that many offshore? Why? What are they using that offshore account, et cetera? Cash funds. This is imperative. We've had a huge push in our company to um, eliminate and reduce our, our cash funds and our petty cash in particular. Um, obviously, there are certain countries that are just cash-based and it's almost impossible to eliminate those funds there, but we have such strict controls around those funds and we test and um, require strict adherence uh, to those controls. So if there's any type of you know, government payment from those accounts or any kind of unusual or suspicious activities, um, that, that that's going to be a serious finding, probably a high-risk finding, and um, disciplinary action will probably ensue. So um, that's, that's something to focus on. Um, your, your company may allow uh, payments to government um, or government, well, hopefully not government officials directly, but government entities from those accounts. Um, those should be highly scrutinized and tested and make sure all the supporting documentation is intact and then those accounts are properly and um, regularly reconciled. Um, with regard to travel and entertainment and gifts, um, huge area, uh, you may find that, um, you know, there's, there's nothing excessive in your audit, there's no crazy trips to Las Vegas or Disney World, you know, or any, no, no extreme outline, outliers. But one thing to um, scrutinize is um, not just for suspicious outliers or, or types of expenses, but also for 
frequency of entertaining certain individuals, um, especially you know government individuals for um, the FCPA. If there is frequent entertainment, you know, let's say you know two or three times a week, every week, the entire year, um, the Department of Justice is, is going to monitor that and look at that, and and that's not going to pass muster. And um, so, also identify as an auditor those types of, of um, frequent transactions, and that should be a finding. Um, obviously, uh, to identify any type of accounts associated with gifts, what are the gifts, or do they abide by your policies, are they excessive, are they frequent, um, well, how will they be viewed? Um, you know, even though it's under $100, but you know, it's a, they, they only paid, I don't know how, but you know, $100 for this iPhone, well, an iPhone itself may be viewed as excessive. So um, just talk with legal counsel and when you identify these things and, um, and, and raise that as you identify them. Um, travel with government officials or national oil companies uh, officials in our uh, situation is, should be very highly scrutinized um, and, and limited, hopefully, by your policies and um, controls. So um, also raise those issues as well. Payroll. Um, so this should be examined in light of potential ghost employees. Um, I had a colleague. Um, she told me of a recent finding at her company where they had, you know, they were they had someone had left the company and they just continued paying them. Um, so that that's one form of of a ghost employee, and they had continued paying them for I don't I think she said under a year, um, but still it was you know it was several months. Um, after they had left the company, and that that to us is a finding, and that's a potential um, weakness and control, and we would have reported it if it was um, a finding in one of our audits. Um, always request a payroll listing, test those um, those listings, make sure those employees are active, and um, we always look at bonus payments um, and ask about those bonus payments. Are they warranted for the position? Are they too high? Why were they given? Were they given off season when bonuses aren't usually given, et cetera? Okay. That's me up as well. And donations and contributions. Um, hopefully, your organization is not giving any political contributions, but check your third party and ask them. Sometimes they may be offended, but still, you have the right to ask. They may not answer it, but um, most of the time, in our case, they will answer. Why are they giving political uh, donations and to whom? And can you test those payments? Um, charitable contributions, uh, here is an example. We found one of our Middle Eastern agents, we saw a word called the cat, Z-A-K-A-T. And we had no idea what it is. Obviously, if you see something you, you don't know, please look it up. And we found out that it meant um, it's an Islamic charity uh, donation. And so obviously, we, we asked for those records, and, and we were closely scrutinized um, all of those payments. And um, thankfully, our third-party agent was willing to um, cooperate with us on that. And there's other words um, for you know different types of donations, um, local donations. So make sure you have you know a translator with you, or you're researching this ahead of time before you go in country. Um, training. Um, what type of training are you giving? Are you giving it to government entities or state-owned entity officials, and why? And is it um, you know tailored to, to what is necessary? Is it excessive? You know, do they have cigars and steaks and fancy wine afterwards and call it a training? You know, is it truly a training? You, you have to make sure to ask all those questions and test around that. Uh, payments under local laws. This um, gets really tricky. This is where it's very important to understand your your business segments. An example we have is one of our business segments um, is is our wireline entity, which deals with explosives and radioactives. And a lot of times in that entity, it requires local police escort, local licensing, specific handling, permits, import licensing, um, bunker uh, controls, et cetera. And all of that is exposure to government entities. So we closely scrutinize that um, product line and business segment and, and test all, all the payments surrounding um, that entity. Um, Let's see, obviously, customs authorities and, and uh, licensing, any type of licensing um, should be tested. Uh, payments made to third parties. Um, and this isn't just our 
um, high risk uh, third parties, which are, are commercial sales representatives or uh, distributors, but um, other other third parties as well, your professional agents, um, those types of payments should also be tested. And I'm going to pass it now to Jennifer. Oh, polling question. Yeah, we're going to do polling question number three now. Okay, before we launch the polling questions, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. And one of them, uh, I think now would be a good time to discuss that, and that's on facilitation payments. Uh, Robin wants to know, is it true that the FCPA does not allow facilitation payments. My understanding is that they are allowed as long as they are recorded correctly in the books and records of the U.S. company. Okay, so I'll answer this one. The FCPA itself um, doesn't prohibit FC, uh, facilitating payments. And yes, of course, they should be uh, recorded accurately. However, the Department of Justice will still scrutinize those payments and they can determine whether or not it's a true facilitation payment or it's really a cover for a bribe, especially if those facilitation payments are, are made often or are, are, are odd in nature or have some peculiar uh, characteristic to them. So it's going to be the DOJ's subjective interpretation of that payment. So um, I'm happy to work for a company that absolutely prohibits facilitation payments. And hopefully your company um, does as well or uh, take the lead in that because um, I don't think you want to be arguing in front of the DOJ whether or not this is really a facilitating payment or whether it's a bribe. Um, now, the UK Bribery Act does prohibit those. So if your operations at all um, uh, uh, you know, have the, are subject to the jurisdiction of the UK Bribery Act, then um, that will be, you know, absolutely prohibited. Very good. Okay, let me launch the third polling question. In the meantime, I believe I forwarded some chat messages, which are other questions that have come in to both uh, you and Marianne. So if you take a look at your chat, maybe you can see which of those questions you'd like to address. Uh, at this point, let me go ahead and uh, launch the third polling question. Okay, and this one is what types of electronic data would you request prior to your audit plan? So go ahead and vote. Uh, we've got a question here that came in uh, from Mark. Where do the fines and penalties collected go when a company has been convicted for violations of FCPA and pays a civil penalty? Why aren't the company's senior executives charged criminally and go to jail, those who sanction such actions? Wow. That's a tough one. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer the, the second part of that question. Um, there have been senior executives um, that have been, have been charged, um, and the DOJ and that trend is increasing. Historically, that, that hasn't been common, but um, that trend is recently increasing. The first part of the question, I'm, I'm not sure I understand where does the money go. Um, of the penalties, it, it you know, DOJ and SEC assesses those penalties, so it goes back to the government. Um, it the we know that the um, DOJ uh, and SEC has heavily hired and increased their staff um, to uh, hire more skilled and trained individuals um, from industry, from a variety of, of different sectors. Um, and uh, are more heavily staffed than in the past, so perhaps it's going there, but otherwise I'm, I can't speak on behalf of the government. Let me go ahead and close the polling question now. We've got about 92% of voted, so uh, register your votes very quickly if uh, you're looking for CPE. Uh, we'll keep it open for another five seconds or so, get those last minute votes in. And again, you don't have to answer this correctly, but you do have to answer. You do have to respond to the polling question. So we will go ahead and we will close the poll now. And we will share the results. And it looks like the majority said all of the above. OK. And that is correct. OK, 
let me go ahead and hide that question and turn it back to you, Jennifer and Marianne. All right, so we're going to get into um, some of the data analysis now in the executing anti-corruption audits using a risk-based approach. My, um, my approach for doing fraud and FCPA auditing is that I want to identify journal entries or transactions or personnel that have multiple risk factors. So what I do is um, gather as much data as possible, download GL line items, expense reports, credit card transactions, things like that. We create, I create separate data files for each test, you know, anywhere from five to 15 tests. I want to link them together, and then I want to identify which journal entries hit most of those tests. Not most, but the, the largest number of those tests. So, um, uh, and then I'm going to focus on those that, that uh, have the most risk, risk factors because they, they came up during most of those tests. So for an example, here are some examples of the tests that we would perform. And again, you'll notice a lot of these you can use for fraud testing, not just for anti-corruption. Uh, first of all, manual payments. Anytime you have business in a country where a check was written, instead of going through your typical um, electronic payment system, uh, you can work with accounting to identify those in your company. We use SAP. Sometimes it'll be a specific document type. Sometimes it might be a specific posting key. It, there might be a specific payment block or payment type. So it's kind of up to you to identify that in your own company. But it's, it's, that's always important for us to look at, anything that was stopped in a check that was written manually. We want to take a look at duplicates. That's pretty typical for the audit universe. Round dollar or round currency payment invoices that may be less important in some countries that have currencies that don't use pennies and where everything is a round dollar. Um, some of those might be Equatorial Guinea and Vietnam, where the uh, um, the currency is is a lot different than it is in the U.S. We want to look at compliance sensitive words and compliance sensitive accounts, and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, we want to specifically look at what I, we term credit cash debit expense, where someone bypasses the vendor uh, accounts payable. Or they just do a, a journal entry that credits cash, debits, and expense. Because what should really happen is that you, um, that you, you also, as part of the journal entry, use an accounts payable account. And that kind of bypasses that. So we want to look at those. Uh, sequential invoices, that's typically a fraud type of um, a test, but it can also be an indicator of a, a much smaller vendor uh, that perhaps a bigger company might, uh, where we're their only uh, customer. Uh, we want to look at prohibited vendors, so there are lots of tools that we can use, and you can also consult trade compliance and a sanctions attorney at your own company to take a look at vendors that might be prohibited, um, their use might be prohibited by the U.S. government. Uh, we take a look at authorization limits. Again, this is something that you do most likely in every audit, where you want to look at transactions that are right at $2,450, $2,400, $2,450 if their if uh, transaction limit is at right at $2,500. And then offshore bank accounts. And we're going to take a look at identifying offshore bank accounts today, compliance sensitive words and accounts, uh, and uh, we're going to look at manual payments, I believe, too. So that's what we're going to do next. So this is a little bit of an ugly slide, but if you're an IDEA user, you might recognize it. I'm going to just walk through it for a moment because it reflects what my tr I want my transactions and what I want my testing to look like when I'm done. So number one, on the left side of the slide, um, uh, I have the list of the tests that I've run. So if you see number one on the left, it'll say, let's say my first test was split invoices. Test B was disbursements below the approval limit. Test C was duplicate disbursements. Um, I actually create a field in IDEA. It's the last field. It's called test. And I put the name of the test in that field, just a regular text field that I can add. I append all those together and summarize them, um, as you can see in one. So on number two, um, if I summarize all the tests based on journal ID, I'll see on number two, close to the right, you'll see a journal entry number. And for instance, the first journal entry number hit seven of my tests. Of course, this is demo data. 
So uh, when I created the data, I wanted to make sure that I had some high ones. <laughs> I had to sort of man man manipulate it to make sure I had good test results for this uh, webinar. So uh, as an example, again, you've got three journal entries that hit seven tests. And in IDEA, I want to be able to click that six or seven, as I've highlighted. Um, and then when I click that number six, it's going to go back and show me all the line items. So for number three that's in the middle, I've clicked number six. Um, I'm sorry, the, about the six line items highlighted. And when I pull it up showing the summarization, it shows me that it hit the split invoice test. It hit the duplicate disbursement test. It hit three compliance-sensitive words. And it's, a, and it's also a payment that's booked to a compliance-sensitive account. And those compliance-sensitive accounts are going to be all of those, journal, those general ledger accounts that we spoke about earlier, such as customs and facilitating payments and travel and licenses and things like that. So I, I guess my point on this slide is to begin with the end in mind, as the Franklin Covey guy says, is that if you start your testing off, it, thinking about what you want your end product to be, it will be a lot easier. So, and then the number one thing I do, again, is that I put a, I, I create a new column in IDEA called test, so that when I summarize, when I pen these and summarize these, I will be able to see every test that my transaction hit. Again, we're using demo data for all this, and so none of the data that I'm using reflects uh, any accounts in Baker Hughes. Jennifer? Uh, we've got a question here. Please elaborate on compliance sensitive words and accounts. Certainly. I'm going to do that right now because I'm going to go to the next slide. Do you mind if I do that and go through those? Sure. And then another question came in. How do you identify payments made to offshore accounts from your payment data? We're going to do that as well. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Those are great questions. I'm okay. glad we're all on the same page that those are the most, a lot of people ask those types of questions. Good. Um, I'm going to switch to, uh, let me go through this slide and I promise I'm going to answer those questions. Um, this is a slide that shows how we might analyze the chart of accounts. What I do is I use a multi-state field. So on the bottom of the page, I, you'll see that I have uh, imported my GL accounts into IDEA. Um, the first column is the account and the name, the second column is total. The third column is the general category of the GL account. And then I create a multi-state field so that my team and I can go through each of these uh, accounts and identify which ones we think are appropriate. So in my multi-state field, I use a minus one in the parameter, and that means that the multi-state field will be blank. If I click it once, it'll be a check mark. If I click it again, it'll be an X. If I click it again, it'll be a question mark, and then it will move back to a blank. So my team and I can go through and um, sort of identify and mark which GL accounts we want to identify as compliance sensitive GL accounts. And you'll see here we have commissions, discounts, third party cost of goods sold, things like that. We definitely want to identify commissions as a high risk account. Um, here's our compliance sensitive word search. So you can use the looping search that's available. It's pretty cheap on the automation site. And what the looping search will do is um, go through and create a, um, let me make sure I have the right one. If you have a list of compliance sensitive words, and I'm sorry, my, I'm happy to provide that to you. My uh, slide doesn't have it on here. If you have a, a list of compliance sensitive words, such as travel, advance, custom, license, commission, things like that, permit, you can use the looping search in with, that um, you can purchase from automation. And um, you can import, it's a, it's a macro that you can buy. You can import your word list from Excel, run it against a, a uh, field, a, a text field in your IDEA document that you identify. And then this is an example of the result that it gives you. So it's going to show me any type of, any journal entry shown by the primary key is the journal ID. And it's going to show all of the journal entries in the text that included a list, a word on my compliance sensitive word list. So for instance, in this case, I had travel and we have advance on there as well. So all the travel advances came up. I had the word permit. So you'll see on the right hand side for document detail text, um, 
uh, we had permit fees, rig site permits, permits, things like that. Unfortunately, the the term offshore is not such a good word for oil and gas company. You'll get so many so many hits on that. Um, but I also encourage you to to truncate the words as much as you can because, for instance. You might have a word like commission. You might have, let's say, facilitating. Some people say facilitating. Some people say facilitation. So just use facilitate. Um, uh, travel, and there are also a lot of other good examples of, of truncating words as much as possible so that you can include. So this is a good example of a compliance sensitive word search that we have using the looping search that's available from automation. It's pretty cheap. I think it's only about 50 bucks or so. I'm not sure, though. Uh, the next one that we have is the word list maker. And this one is uh, it's pretty great. Instead of doing a, um, instead of your giving idea a list of your compliance sensitive words, um, compli uh, automation has developed a macro that will go through your text fields and will identify all the words that are used the most in the text fields in your journal entry. So for instance, again, this is demo data, but we used it to compile a word list based on the reference and the text. Um, the reference and the text in, um, in our, uh, sorry, those fields, and it came up with words like Nigeria, limited, international, DHL, custom, duty, visa, things like that. Um, so uh, you can go through yourself and take a look at words that might be used in the area that you're auditing, which you might not know about. So um, there are a few words that come up every once in a while. I think one of them was on a, um, an ENY study that I saw last year where people in a certain country were saying, where's my pie? And the word pie was coming up a lot. I think Marianne had a note that there was, they would use the word tea, tea. in certain places. So tea, discount, promotion, a lot of that can, can be used as a, a facade for, for bribe yeah. or facilitating payment. They all have special words they kind of use. So it's pretty important. It's very to, cultural <laughs> specific too yeah. and, and country specific and language specific. Um, we were in Malaysia and we actually asked an outside counsel to put together a list and, and she came up with all these words we would have never ser searched for and so that was helpful. Um, also I, I uh, saw a note that AuditNet has a list of more more than 4,000 keywords, that's great. And then um, Forbes actually has a great article on um, bribery jargon. And so you could look that up. You can just Google Forbes bribery jargon um, to help you create your uh, word list. Yeah, the Forbes, the Forbes article lists about 30 words or phrases. And it does translate some of them into foreign languages as well. The, the list that we developed through AuditNet has 4,000 words. And we developed that based on input from, uh, from a survey that we did. And we also had somebody in Holland, in the Netherlands, that actually translated those keywords into Dutch. And we're working on other translations as well. Uh, it really uh, the question that I have is in terms of the compliance sensitive words and the word list maker, does that just uh, does that look at unstructured data or is it just general ledger financial data? I don't think that well it's got to be in a data format. So if, if you if unstructured data is more like emails and documents and things like that, right. then um, I don't think it's used for that. Okay. It has right. to be in a database type of format, in a field, in one of one of your text fields in a database format. Okay. Um, this seems to be a lot more modern way to do things, and I've seen people do it through SQL commands, and it can be a bit arduous, but the word list maker uh, makes it pretty easy. Okay. Um, it, it runs pretty quickly. Yeah, I think that was uh, demonstrated during a uh, webinar that we did last December. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful tool. Great. Let me keep going. Here are the manual entries. Um, it, this is an example of SAP. Here are the T codes that I use to look at this. So the, um, you can use um, SBL1N for vendor line items. You can use 3N and 5N for GLI items, customer line items. I use tables BSAK um, for vendor payments. And for instance, um, 
again, you can your your manual payments might be shown as a do, as a document type, a posting key, payment method, payment block. And I just got one example out of a table. It's a standard table, BSAK. It has vendor line items, payments, and uh, invoices. Uh, for PM, that's called payment method. Um, uh, and your payment methods are going to be different. They're different in every every country. And then PBK is payment block. It's also a standard field. So that's kind of an example of, of what you might want to look at. You might want to extract all of the vendors or all of the payments that have a payment block A or B. Maybe that means manual. Um, e might be electronic. C might be check. So you might uh, just work with accounting to, to determine how to identify those payments, those manual payments. We really scrutinize manual payments. Anything that was stopped and paid specifically, any time a check has to be written to a government official, because that's just sort of the way it is in some countries, we really scrutinize anything that's stopped and paid manually, as I'm sure any audit, financial audit and operational audit would have, as well. Here are the vendor bank accounts. So here's the answer to the question for offshore. And I, again, am going to use SAP demo data as a specific example. The SAP tables for vendors um, are LSA1 is the vendor master, um, LSBK is the vendor master bank, or bank account table. So let's say if I'm doing an audit in Australia, which is AU, I might download all of the vendors and take a look at the country for uh, the Australia GM market or for whatever region I'm in. And then I take those vendors and I use table LFBK to show all of their bank account information. And I compare the country of the vendor to the country of the bank account. So in the middle of uh, middle right, the lower right of the slide, you'll see on, on the left, you'll say table LFA1, that's the country of the bank account, with the arrows over to um, the right, which is table LFBK. And I'm pointing out specifically, again, this is demo data, uh, the first error shows that the country is Australia for the vendor, but the bank country is CH and that's Switzerland. Um, those are always interesting ones to look at <laughs> anytime you see an offshore a Swiss bank account. Um, and then the second one is uh, an Australian vendor and the bank accounts in PG is Papua New Guinea. So uh, that is the way that I identify offshore or any time where the vendor country is not equal to bank country. It's up to you to um, read and understand, as well as it's up to me to do that as well, to understand your company's policy on offshore bank accounts. Um, they're different in every country, so you kind of have to ask yourself, is, uh, is it allowable in your country? And there, are there reasons, are there acceptable reasons uh, for offshore bank accounts? Um, we also take a look sometimes with vendors with no bank account. So how are they being paid, basically? If um, we're making payments and they have no account, does that mean they're all cash? Does that mean they're, they're checks? Things like that. So that's um, my answer to the offshore, uh, offshore uh, bank account. So these are all types of, uh, you know, four or five examples of the types of individual tests that we would run, um, the types of individual tests that we would run. And then, I, again, we would combine, uh, let's say after I finished this, I would have uh, five or six different data files. I would append them together and summarize them so I could perhaps come up with some transactions that hit a compliance-sensitive word and a compliance-sensitive count, those two are similar, but they also had an offshore bank account and they were also a manual payment. Those are the types of things that you really want to spend your time focusing on, focusing on the high-risk transactions. I, um, I, I always say it's against my religion to do random sampling because I didn't come from a SOX or an external audit background. So I'm all about uh, data analysis and, and spending my time on high-risk transactions. I think this sort of comes to the end of our presentation. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ann to talk about closing and reporting in a second, and then we'll be happy to answer more questions um, if you have them. Before, just... before we get into that, Mary Ann, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> we just have one question, a general question in terms of IDEA. How many records can IDEA contain in a single data table? IDEA is unlimited. It's only limited to the um, storage you have available on your hard drive. That's what makes it so much better than Excel and Access. 
Okay. It's unlimited. I've used in the millions and millions of records to do manual journal entry testing at year end. I mean, up to, I mean, two or three, up to 20 to 30 million records I've used before, but it's unlimited. Okay, and then we, before we get to that uh, final section, uh, Bob asked, what if a foreign country location you're auditing is smart enough to know what the red flag bribery jargon words or phrases are and camouflage or label those accounts or journal entry description as something else? How would so they... So we do a couple of things. First of all, we, um, we target specific general ledger accounts, um, but we also ask to see bank statements and we take a sample out of bank statements, um, no matter what GL account they're in. So, um, I mean, there's only so much you can do if someone's going to go out of their way to try to hide something. But not only do we we select specific GL accounts, we want to see um, we want to see their bank statements, and we take samples from the bank statement as well. Also, um, in response to that question, the uh, we don't just but that's not. Those aren't the only terms we focus on. There's so much other testing going on. Meanwhile, that if there's our auditors are pretty savvy and experienced, and if they just see anything that's just out of the ordinary, or a payment in a field that's just an outlier, or um, a, you know terminology they they haven't really seen before, um, uh, things like that 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 should be that helps prompt them to, to uh, search further and, and, and dig down further. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, it's a great question, and, and our stance isn't, you know, we solely rely on our list and are limited to our list. We're constantly asking questions, and this is where legal interviews help. Um, several interviewees will, will mention something, and something I haven't heard of before, or um, uh, mention, you know, report on someone else doing something, and, and those words then get passed on to auditors to, to, to examine. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So closing and reporting. So this is our um, last slide. Well, there's one more just for useful resources, but this is pretty much the end. Um, so key takeaway is there is constant back and forth communication with legal and audit. These audits are exhausting, but, you know, sort of exciting. For me, it's like, when I was a litigator and it's like preparing for trial and you're in the middle of trial work. Um, it's just constant communication over lunch, dinners, breakfast, we're, um, we're, we're communicating our findings and our concerns and, and any uh, kind of things that we're seeing that come up that are you know repeated types of um, transactions or issues that uh, seem like outliers or something peculiar. Um, so just constant communication. Um, next is management communication. We involve our managers. We involve them in, in findings as we go so that they can be a part of it and have ownership and help us um, you know, get supporting documentation or, or emails or whatever to help explain whatever we're um, trying to uh, analyze. And then we have an on-site closing meeting um, with management, stakeholders, key finance personnel. And then the final report is a joint report drafted by both legal and uh, audit. Uh, the next slide that we have are just some useful resources. We won't go through them, but they're part of your handout. And then we left room at the end for questions, but we're kind of right at the end. So I'll turn it back to James to ask more questions or to close the webinar. Yeah, I don't Thank see it. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you both, Marianne and, uh, and Jennifer. You did a, a great job today and answered a lot of uh, great questions and provided a lot of good information. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions that they think of after the fact, uh, they can send them in to myself, uh, uh, Jay Kaplan at auditnet.org, and I can forward them on to Marianne or Jennifer. Or, uh, I think that their contact information is also available. Uh, somebody just asked how we get the slides. The slides are available uh, as a download, and basically those uh, uh, there should be a link for handouts, and the handouts are available for you to access directly from, uh, from the site. Uh, at this point, I wanted to thank both of you again. For a great presentation. Also thank uh, uh, Caseware Analytics for helping to put this together. I think this was a, a very useful uh, 
uh, webinar, you will be receiving a link to the recording. That link will come to you tomorrow. Uh, the CPE, if you've answered all the polling questions, you will receive a CPE certificate. Those will be sent out uh, the middle of next week. Uh, I would imagine is when we can uh, when we can get to those. We have to review all of the records before we uh, go ahead and uh, and send those out. So again, thanks to everybody for attending. Thanks for the great questions, and look forward to seeing you all again on a uh, on a future webinar. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.